often when they speak about mental health, they speak about Canada as though it was a homogenous place, and we know that that's not true at all. And certainly the First Nations people are in a one entire category. The black people have been here a very long time, since the 1600s actually, and uh, the Chinese have been here a very long time building the railroads. The Asia, South Asians also and many other nationalities. And So the question is, if you don't come from a Eurocentric uh, place, does it make any difference uh, how I talk to you about access and treatment and uh, how your family handles the experiences of mental illness. My grandfather would have come uh, in 1906 to the West Coast and so he was there uh, really well before the uh, South Asians could have passports which was around 1947. So my mother was born in Canada. She was the first one of, of my grandfather's children who was born in Canada. And then I was born uh, in Canada. So there's a generational story of their saga of migration and the partition of India and of the way that colonialism shifted and how immigrants began to get passports and be recognized as equal citizens on the West Coast, which was uh, mainly the Chinese, the Japanese, the Asians who encountered various kinds of obstacles. So that's certainly part of my growing up, yeah. is respecting diversity. We actually lived on the island, on Vancouver Island. Uh, my mother grew up in a very tiny community on Vancouver Island called Baldy, and uh, that's where my parents married. They had actually, the South Asians had come right along the west coast, so the California uh, migration and the and the West Coast migration happened at the same time, uh, just like it did for the Japanese and the Chinese. So the the story of, of mental illness in in my family too came from that time because my grandmother uh, was uh, quite uh, quite ill with depression when she was uh, after she migrated and spent time in the mental asylum in uh, Edsondale, which was in Vancouver. And I was very close to my grandmother, so I was aware of all these stories. And uh, I also had a brother with autism, so I had a lot of experience peripherally just seeing what my family went through. And I know it was very difficult. I always wanted to go into medicine, but I also wanted to be an artist when I was young. And then eventually I did get in, into medical school. And I wasn't uh, sure what I wanted to do, but it seemed like psychiatry just became something that interested me. I have been drawing since I was very young, and certainly uh, a woman artist was not a very acceptable um, profession as far as uh, my community was concerned. I think it was quite a, a little bit of an outrageous idea uh, from their point of view. Um, but then even going to medical school was, was very rare. Going to university for a woman, I was the first one in my family who I was a woman going to university. And, and I uh, was very privileged, I think, because I, I had these options. Most of the young women I grew up with were married uh, by arranged marriages, very young. So I didn't want to live in, in, a, in a very traditional way. And that was part of growing up, I think, as a hybrid person that have great love for things Indian, but I also I'm a Canadian. I was very interested in really in identity and in therapy and in working with families but there was an openness at that time to looking at global health and uh, diversity and what was important in healing throughout the world and and how it it was very different in Africa and very different in India and and who would be really interested in those kind of issues because you didn't have to travel anymore and make diversity exotic 
since we lived in a multicultural city. And I saw that in psychoanalysis also, it was very Eurocentric in terms of how it understood development and um, how much discourse there was about the rest of the world. Those were very important uh, searches. And I had to look, I had to find people in the world that wanted to have those kind of discourses for many, many reasons. We have massive migrations taking place in the world. And I think it is no longer possible for people to ignore uh, these premises that were there in the 1960s that people melted because they arrived in under an American flag and they all became homogenous because that simply wasn't and isn't true. How people are divided by power and in as minorities and whether racism and colonialism still play a part in how people suffer or evolve or become resilient. Uh, so these questions may have been less uh, noticed before, but I think now there's much more, fortunately I think, much more dialogue about this. There's much more interest in how dialogue can change societies and social spaces and offer options, including in healing. So we have to understand social dimensions of health. And that's become more clear at a policy level. When things become clear at a policy level, then they tend to become more mainstream in training. The brain by itself is a frontier because we actually know less about the brain um, than we do about many other organs. Many people say, well, we're going to take another hundred years to really even understand the brain and its complexities. But they also, we see that very much of psychiatry is also about humanism. It's also about social suffering. And how do we understand that suffering? If families break down because of slavery, what's the legacy of slavery and mental health then? So we have to look at those questions uh, as social questions and historical questions and colonial and post-colonial questions. We have a great deal to learn from our patients. If we don't understand their history, we're, we've lost a huge dimension of what they have to teach us. We're going through some very difficult times in the world. We have to enter into some kind of dialogue with this. But there's also the deeper meaning of what brings us joy and what helps us survive suffering and how do we use our suffering um, to grow. I think it's been a time, a new era in, in, in terms of global politics, in terms of isolationism and xenophobia and scapegoating a minority. So we can't, we can't afford to be naive, that you may not be directly implicated, but indirectly we are all implicated in that discourse. Do I think that cultural psychiatry is part of the, uh, one of the players in the discussion? Yes, I do. It's about everyone's unique life um, is important. That there's voice and agency and there's a narrative in each person's story that is a gift. And so I think out of one story, many stories can begin to become important. And I think in the invisibility of stories is a huge problem. When something breaks down and isn't working for the dignity of human beings in our country, we have something to gain from that story. Because it is the story and narratives of people's lives that we can learn about what the way forward is and how to make ourselves better humanists.